This is a Frontline Club event recorded on 14th of May 2020. A discussion on US elections with Susan Glasser, Ed O'Keefe, and Jim Notte. First, uh, we're going to introduce uh, James Notte, special correspondent for, the B- for BBC News. He has a new book out, just uh, came out last month. It's called On the Road American Adventures. I can know, I can know way. James, maybe you can show that to. Great, there it is. I will. And, and the not, audio not is available does James in the book. <laughs> Terrific. And okay. not only does James have the book, but the Mail on Sunday calls it thought provoking, constantly surprising, and hugely entertaining. Uh, James, uh, Jim uh, presented on the Today, presented the Today program on Radio 4 for 24 20 years and has been traveling in the States since 1970. Um, up in the higher panel is Ed O'Keefe. You, you know him from uh, working as a political correspondent at CBS News covering the campaign. He pre- previously covered U- the U.S. Congress for the Washington Post and reported on the 2008 and 2012 presidential and congressional elections. And uh, just below me in the uh, panel below is Susan Glasser, who writes the column letter from Trump's Washington at the New Yorker, where she's a staff writer. Uh, she was a top ed- she was top editor of several Washington publications. Uh, she was at the editor at Politico and editor in chief of Foreign Policy, and worked for a decade at the Washington Post. So it's a fabulous lineup that actually, in or- ordinary times, in the midst of the campaign, we probably couldn't do here in London. There's no way we'd be able to get everybody across the Atlantic. So to some degree, this is uh, this is kind of fortunate. Um, I wanted to start and and ask you, feel whoever would like to jump in, maybe Susan on this, and and that is. How has the pandemic changed the issues in this race five months out from election day? And which candidate do you think is better positioned to take advantage of? Well, thank you so much, Frank. And thank you, obviously, to everyone who's uh, tuning in today. Uh, it's uh, always good to take a break, although I have to say, like in the past, you know, we were always looking for opportunities to take a break from Trump's Washington. But uh, one uh, subsidiary results, of course, of the pandemic is that uh, we are all stuck 24 hours a day uh, in the same loop of coverage. And I would say that that really is, you know, the the, the signal storyline of both this year and this American presidential election, uh, which is that uh, the pandemic has overwhelmed uh, any other story. Uh, it is completely disrupted not only daily life uh, in the U.S. And, and across the globe, but it has rewritten the presidential campaign uh, uh, in a way that uh, you can probably tell uh, if you're paying even casual attention uh, to Donald Trump's Twitter feed, uh, you know, it has left him deeply unsettled and deeply concerned. Uh, You know, most American presidential elections after four years uh, of an incumbent are referenda on the incumbent. And I think that's going to be all the more so the case Uh, given that we're experiencing such a disruptive event, uh, not only with enormous public health consequences, and by the way, we're set to surpass 100,000 deaths from the uh, coronavirus this month in the United States, but also, of course, to the economy. So, you know, it's it's put Trump back on his heels uh, in a defensive mode that has him lashing out. But one cautionary note before I let everybody else jump in, which is to say, because Trump has been such a polarizing and divisive figure for so long, uh, it means that very few people haven't already made up their minds about him. Uh, And so we are not seeing the wild swings of public opinion about Trump and also therefore the wild disruptions in political polling that you might expect or that you're seeing uh, in the UK, for example. Uh, And so, you know, views of Trump are remarkably stable and fixed. And actually, if you look, his approval rating right now is right around 40%, which is right exactly where it's basically been since January 20th, 2017. And I wanted to go to you for a question following up on what Susan just said, and that is usually um, an election after first term, the economy really is very determinative. If you have a good co- economy, that's very positive for the incumbent. Uh, and Trump was going to run on the economy until a few months ago. Do you see how much do you see the economy playing into this? And given the numbers that Susan was just talking about, the highest in the world, do you get a sense that some voters will hold him accountable for that? You were talking to me, Frank, right? Yeah, Ed, excuse me. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it, it'll totally be an issue. You know, as some have said, by November, every American is either going to know somebody who's lost a job 
or know somebody who's died from this. And so how can that not in one way or another potentially wear on their decision? Uh, and to Susan's point, he has an incredibly fixed percentage of people who like him, but for the you know, small percentage of people in this country who might swing either way, uh, you know, by November, it's just gonna depend a lot on, do I still have a job? Does my family, do my children, do my neighbors? you know, what happened to my sick relative who had this disease and how well were they treated? They will take it out in one way or another on either the president or some other down ballot election that they're holding in their community because it's one of the ways that they'll be able to express themselves. And so the economy absolutely will be a top concern. Uh, the president knows that. He's terrified at the prospect of being judged on it. Just this morning, he was uh, asked in an interview with uh, the Fox Business Network about it. Uh, host pointed out that about 36 million people now are unemployed and he immediately snapped and said, well, but nobody blames me for that. Um, you know, you can't blame them for the pandemic necessarily, but certainly the decisions made since then are ones that many are going to blame him for. Uh, and one of them is the economic fallout of this, especially if other parts of the country are, or, sorry, other parts of the world are seen to be rebounding from this faster than the United States can as a whole. So. Uh, it's a big concern for him, um, and it certainly now is really the only issue at this point. It's coronavirus and, you know, management of it, general competence, the economy, and how do you, f how do you get the country out of this? And that's it. I mean, there's really very little room for anything else at this point. Maybe it's some tangential wedge issue like the future of the Supreme Court. But beyond that, uh, there's really nothing else to talk about. No, nothing else really that most voters will worry about going into November. Uh, Jim, I'd like to go for you, to you. You've been in and out of the United States since the 70s, as, as your book points out. Mm -hmm. I, I'd just like to get a sense of how the country feels to you in the last year or two, and especially heading into this election, compared to other elections that you followed. Um, and well, as, a, as a bit mm -hmm. of a, an outsider with, with a different lens, curious to see how you see it. I think there are two things uh, that I'd say, uh, Frank, in answer to that. And the first is just following up what Susan and Ed have said about the campaign. It seems to me what's fascinating about it, when you look at how the economy will play compared with what everybody thought it would do in the campaign nine months ago, um, what has happened in this campaign is that the, the culture war, as I suppose we all call it, which, you know, began, what, in the mid-90s, really, but exploded into life with the Trump election and his, the production of Trump as, the, as almost the end point of that culture war between right and left or right and liberals. What this means is that that whole question of what your sets of beliefs are that you cannot abandon and have to wave like a banner in war becomes even more the defining question of this campaign because of Trump's predicament in how he's handled a, an obvious crisis um, is that he is going to have to, as the common phrase has it now, double down on, you know, Trump versus the world. Limbaugh was saying the other night, you know, it's war. I read Tucker Carlson's latest meditation on the crisis the other night. And I mean, it is now, you know, the culture war squared. Now, you could argue that's good for Trump, but picking up on Ed's point, it seems to me uh, that if you look at the people who were uh, falling off the Trump wagon in the 2018 midterms, for example, especially in suburbs, are they going to decide that faced with this polar question, they side with Trump given what's happened in the last three months? As an outsider, I would have thought um, that's a big ask for, for his campaign. But just one last thing to answer your central point. Um, I first, arrived in the States as a, an 18 year old student in 1970 and you know went around the country in a Greyhound bus which we all did uh, after a summer working in a kosher hotel in the Borscht Belt which dropped me more than you know um, I think I could have learned in five years anywhere else it was fantastic anyway um, of course it was at the height of the Vietnam era or at least two-thirds through it and I realized in a way that I'd sort of realized from newsreels and so on but but not with my own eyes how extraordinarily divisive that was in families and in small towns because everyone knew someone who had had a tragedy. And of course, the number of dead in the virus crisis is, has now exceeded the number, 60,000 thereabouts who died in Vietnam. 
it seems to me as a regular visitor over the years, I mean, you know, several times a year, that America's never actually been as divided as it was during Vietnam, but for very, very different reasons. Uh, the history of it is completely different. The, the wild 60s were a prelude to, to what happened with the war as a backdrop. This is completely different, but the divisions in families between people and, and people who are holding ever more uh, strongly and devotedly to their belief, their position, the set of values that they represent seems to me more divided than I've ever known it before. Uh, that is an outsider's view, but I feel it very strongly. Ed and Susan, you made a great point, which is um, President Trump's support rarely goes below 40%. And I think a lot of people in Europe, they consume the same news everyone else does about President Trump. That surprises them. And so I had, the question I had is, can you explain to people why he has that hard floor, what he seems to have a very hard, strong floor in, in the low 40s? And who is he and who are he and Joe Biden going to be fighting over? You know, most people know Joe Biden very well. They know Donald Trump very well in the United States. Who are they fighting over? Or will this really come down to turnout? Um, whoever wants to jump in first. Well, I mean, to the point about... Uh, is anyone in America left who is persuadable, right, essentially, is the question that you're asking. You know, there are really two different models to our national elections. And, in, you know, historically, right, there were sort of core Democratic areas, core Republican areas, and uh, toss-up states. You know, Ohio was always seen as the, the decider, uh, or Florida uh, more recently. Uh, but essentially, you know, Donald Trump didn't invent this political polarization. It's actually been, you know, increasing over the last couple decades. So when I was a kid, uh, the election of 1976, there were 24 states, uh, you know, out of 50 uh, that were genuinely competitive in that election, which was very close between uh, Jimmy Carter and Gerald Ford. Uh, you know, flash forward to uh, the election before Donald Trump, there were essentially 10 states that were seen as uh, at all competitive, right? So it's a, it's a, a shrinkage in half, really, of the, the competitive playing field of American politics before Donald Trump, who's one of the most naturally divisive political figures we've ever seen. So he is like, you know, taking that pre-existing condition of polarization, I think, and, and putting it on steroids. And, you know, even Barack Obama, who, of course, has a very different political affect, is a different kind of political character, he had the insight into two political campaigns that he won uh, in the U.S. that essentially uh, all elections in the U.S. were now base elections, uh, you know, that essentially uh, when faced with a choice between motivating your own supporters and turning them out versus competing over the dwindling share of genuinely undecided or independent voters, uh, you know, that politicians were, it was a smarter bet to motivate your own supporters and figure out how to get them. In part, that's because Americans turn out in historically in much lower numbers than in European countries and other democracies, right? So that means that there's more advantage in rallying your potentially otherwise apathetic supporters. Donald Trump, has taken that approach that Obama used successfully uh, and uh, written a script for his own brand of much more confrontational negative politics. You know, Obama was an inspirer. He, he used a different way of appealing to the base, but you could argue that the theory of the case was not dissimilar. Uh, and so uh, again, I think especially now that nobody knows what the consequences of the pandemic are going to be for voting and, you know, what does vote by mail do to American turnout and how do you get your people out? Uh, I think both parties are going to retreat to a large extent to the safe zone uh, of figuring out how to talk to their own people and get them actually to, to vote, especially in these weird conditions. Can I just pop in with a, a picking sure, up yeah. on Susan's point there on the election itself, I mean, the mechanics of the election. And we all know the arguments about voter registration and suppression, so-called, by one side, and all that. But if we have in the States still, a, you know, almost a state of emergency nationally, the whole issue of voting by mail and so on becomes important. And it seems to me that if you look at the communities where that is going to pose a problem, 
for the candidate, i.e. Biden, it's potentially an extremely serious problem for the Democrats looking from where we are now. Now, it may well be that some wonderful state of normality uh, kicks in before September, October, but surely we doubt it. And I, I think the effect on the actual process itself is going to be one that we're going to become very interested in. Do you agree with that, Ed? I mean, it seems to me that it's going to be a big yeah, issue. Can you, how do you see that playing out? Obviously, it depends on what the health conditions are in the United States and whether there's a second wave in the fall. But if you could, for uh, our listeners out here, walk us through how that process might work and to whose advantage it, it might be. Well, to whose advantage, we're not going to know really until after the fact, because in fact, uh, Republicans, certainly at the local and the state level, have actually been big proponents of voting by mail and have benefited from it uh, mm -hmm. through the years across many Western uh, and some Southern states. In fact, a special congressional election that was held uh, just north of Los Angeles just yesterday uh, was conducted primarily, or sorry, Tuesday, was conducted primarily by mail. People mailed in their ballots uh, in a state, California, that is now planning to mail a ballot to every single registered voter in the state with prepaid postage. That's an expensive proposition, um, but it's one that they feel is necessary. And, and if I okay. could just jump in, um, is that because many red states are much less populous or much more spread out that it's an well, advantage it, to Republicans, or why is that? In the case of Oregon and Washington, which have been two of the ones that have relied on it the most through the years, yeah, it's part of it. It was a cost issue. It was a belief that, you know, if, if you could just send it a few weeks before the election uh, and people could fill it out and send it back, it would not only potentially cost less money, but also might boost participation because essentially the election is coming to you. You don't have to go to your gymnasium or your public library or the church basement to cast a ballot. Um, and, and so, you know, that, that is the general uh, uh, reason to be for this if you're someone who believes it's a good idea. There are issues over who exactly in some of these states can request one and for what reasons. And then there's questions about when exactly that ballot has to be completed by in order for it to count. We've seen some court cases in states that have essentially said, if that ballot is postmarked on the day of the election, it doesn't have to be received by the Board of Elections that day, but if it's postmarked on the day of the election, it will count. That's a change from the past where it said it had to be received by the day of the election, and it potentially increases the pool of, of votes cast by tens of thousands in some states, depending on how it goes. Those are details, and they're messy, that have to get sorted out by each of the states individually. Regardless, we're going to see more people cast ballots by envelope and not by machine in person this year. And the one big thing I think the rest of the world will have to adjust to is the fact that they won't be able to wake up the next morning on a Wednesday and know necessarily who won. If it is a close election, it could be several days, maybe even several weeks. If it's not a close election, and it's, it's clear that night that you know Biden or Trump has prevailed by wide margins in enough states and has exceeded the 270 electoral votes, it's fine. But if we're all waiting on one state, and that one state relies a lot on ballots that are mailed in, you could be waiting four, five, or six days uh, for, well, for results, if not longer. And the hey, problem it's is not longer. In, in most of those states get counted as they come in, so you'll see day to day, potentially, the margin change. Similar to what we saw in Florida back in 2000, mm -hmm. when recounts were showing sudden differences in the actual count between Bush and Gore. So those are the nightmare scenarios that, uh, we in television and journalists in general and, and elections chairmen all across the country have to worry about, uh, which is why there's that old adage among elections officials, just please don't make it close because if it isn't close and it's a blowout, then, then the results are considered definitive and nobody will really challenge them. But if they're really close, you set up a scenario where potentially one side or the other is really challenging the results and the validity of the whole election. Well, challenge is in? surely the key word there, Ed, because can you imagine a circumstance in which Trump lost very narrowly, I mean, in the way that he, he beat Clinton with, the, you know, whatever it was, 85,000 votes, if he parceled them up the right way in Wisconsin and, and Michigan and Pennsylvania, you would have got, you know, something rather different. Imagine if Trump fails to prevail by a very, very narrow, narrow margin, what he will do. I mean, the mind boggles. He'll be in court for months, won't he? He's not going to lie down and say, look, it was a fair fight, I'd lost. He just isn't. It's not in his DNA, is it? 
We'll see. Uh, but uh, you say, imagine this. Frankly, everyone should imagine every possible scenario and believe that it could happen and be prepared for it mentally uh, and physically. Because at this point, we just don't know what could happen. And that's the attitude I always take. Nothing should surprise you at this point because anything is possible. Right. But then again, uh, you know, the pandemic itself is a reminder uh, that uh, no matter how many times you say that, Ed, uh, you know, the United States uh, was ranked the best prepared country in the world uh, by a scientific panel of experts about a month before the coronavirus pandemic hit. Uh, and we proved to be uh, not equal to our own plan, never mind uh, the moment uh, in any way. And I think, you know, we've been sort of like warning about. Uh, what will Trump do when backed into a corner? What will he do, uh, you know, with the election? Just two days ago, his son-in-law, uh, apparently unaware of the United States Constitution, which specifically prescribes uh, the time and manner in which our presidential elections are held uh, in November uh, of every four years, uh, said he couldn't guarantee uh, whether it would occur, but he didn't know of any ongoing conversations at the moment about changing the time of our national election. So that's the situation that we're living in, folks. You know, it's, it's uh, in a way we become too inward uh, to uh, the craziness and not inward enough. So, you know, Ed's point is well taken uh, that we should be mentally prepared for anything to happen in this election. But the truth is, is that we're actually not capable, it seems to me, of really processing uh, what's already occurring, never mind uh, the theoretical additional uh, crazy things that might occur. And that actually is one of the great challenges of writing and thinking about Washington in this moment. We are dealing with the President of the United States who actually stood up in a press conference and told people to drink uh, you know, bleach, uh, and that essentially, you know, maybe disinfect it would just make the, the this disease uh, miraculously go away, as he said before in the past. Like, how do you write about that and communicate about that using the language of rational political discourse? That's true. And then, can I just add, pick up uh, the point, partly your point there, Susan, but what Ed has said when he talked about physical and mental challenges, uh, at the risk of lowering the tone a little bit, um, that is a physical and mental challenge which you can apply to both of these candidates on uh, the grounds of age, um, on the grounds of, you know, performance of various kinds. Uh, you know, Trump's persona has become so familiar to everyone inside and also outside the United States that people realize how he operates, the kind of high wire that he walks every day. His physical condition doesn't look brilliant. Uh, Joe Biden, despite all the face work, which is considerable, as we all know by the look of it, um, looks his age. I don't know if either of you were in, in New Hampshire just before he skedaddled off to South Carolina, but I saw him on the Saturday afternoon in a little huddle of reporters in a sort of union hall in Manchester. And we were there and Biden was supposed to drop by to shake a few hands. And in fact, he decided to do a, a kind of stand up thing for 25 minutes. And it was, it was the agony of a man who, you know, was in despair, just all pouring out. Now, of course, as we know, it turned around a week later and then on Super Tuesday, but uh, you just thought, you know, he's gone. Now, has he got the energy with the terrible problem of the virus, which keeps him basically in a basement and people are worried about his age, no rallies, fundraising's more difficult than ever. Has he got the stamina and the energy to see this through? And can Trump take the pressure? I think they're both serious questions. To be clear, James, when I said to be physically prepared, I literally meant us, the press. Like, yes, sir. No, I realize that. It just triggered that something my, in my mind. Is that you might need to sleep and rest up now because we yeah. may end up in a situation where we don't sleep for a week waiting for the results, just to be clear. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, but look, uh, but you, you see where my thought came from. About Biden. Uh, and that is one that, you know, the moment has sort of rarely suppressed. Uh, but in reality, this is uh, the contest between the two oldest uh, nominees in, in history in the United States at a time that seems to demand energetic uh, and fresh thinking leadership. Uh, you know, Biden, uh, the main arguments he presented in the Democratic race, which, uh, you know, essentially 
uh, proved to be compelling enough to result in a remarkable turnaround in his primary situation were, were not the hope and inspiration of Barack Obama in 2008. They were number one, uh, really number one through 10, which is I'm the most uh, electable guy to beat Donald Trump with the few persuadable people uh, who decided the election four years ago. And then maybe after numbers one through 10, uh, also, don't you want America to be a, a normal country again? And let's just go back. Sorry, that's my husband weighing in on the uh, <laughs> uh, panel. Would you like to join as well? He says we, you know, just sum it up uh, with that was was what his contribution was. Uh, but yeah, look, let's let let's be real. Biden is not offering a compelling new vision for America. He's offering, uh, you know, sort of the return to normalcy yeah. argument and essentially saying, uh, vote the other guy out more than vote me in. Susan, I wanted to come back to something you mentioned about Jared Kushner. Uh, here across the on the other side of the Atlantic, should people be alarmed by that? Should they take that seriously as a genuine threat that there could be an attempt to delay the election? And then the second question I had related to what Jim was talking about in terms of these two uh, these two candidates, what's it going to be like? What opportunities are they going to have to actually get out and candidate in any conventional way? Um. Well, I think James's point is the correct one. That the threat is not so much uh, that you know Jared Kushner is going to cancel the election. Uh, you know, even if he hasn't read the Constitution, <laughs> others in the Republican Party are definitely familiar uh, with its dictates. Um, uh, I think the scenario that we do have to worry about is the too close to call on election night scenario, and uh, that's where Ed's. Uh, uh, caution to all of us is really, really applicable. Uh, you know, in a, in a too close to call situation, you just don't know how things will shake out. Al Gore, uh, you know, uh, had a decision to make in 2000 about whether to press the recount forward, whether to go ahead with it. Uh, and he chose to do so. It resulted in, uh, you know, a very uh, questionable Supreme Court pr precedent in Bush v. Gore. Uh, and uh, cast a question about of legitimacy over George W. Bush for the first four years that he was in office until he won re-election uh, four years later outside of the margin of closeness. So, uh, you know, at a time when our the legitimacy and stability of our political institutions in the U.S. are already uh, under systemic attack from Trump and other Republicans, uh, that would be really a worst case scenario for American democracy, and we don't know how it would play out. So I'm not so much worried that they're going to cancel the election, uh, but what kind of conditions will the election be taking place in? Uh, will the franchise and the vote really be available to American citizens in the way that ought to be to guarantee maximum participation? Uh, that's something that I worry about, uh, uh, never mind what comes after election. Um, Ed, I wanted to follow up on something that Susan said earlier, and that is a shrinking number of states that end up deciding who becomes president, who enters the Oval Office. Can you talk to people now about which states you think will determine this and what kinds of issues will determine the vote in those states? Yeah, well, it, it's 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 coronavirus and, and all issues adjacent to it that will determine it most likely. Um, and then maybe, you know, what are the most motivating factors at the last moment for any group of people to either mail back their ballot or show up in person? Uh, you got to go back first and foremost to the three states that Trump won narrowly that he wasn't expected to win. Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. He's in Pennsylvania today. Uh, and that's no mistake. He knows that he has to win back that state again to pad an electoral college win. Uh, Michigan, where right now he's trailing Joe Biden hypothetically in a state that voted for him by only about 30,000 votes. Uh, if he loses the Wolverine state, as we call it, uh, again, he's in big trouble. Wisconsin, uh, a state where you have a very strong and strident Republican base up against a Democrat uh, governor and uh, you know, uh, a Democratic Party voting tradition, uh, that one may be uh, the one that r remains the most competitive of those three, at least if you look at surveys right now. 
Beyond those three, I'd look at maybe just one or two others. Arizona, out in the Southwest, uh, the first state the president visited once he was uh, freed from the shackles of the White House and was able to start traveling a little bit again. That one is one that Democrats have had on their target list for quite some time, and that demographically and politically very well could go their way this time. And again, there's another example that if Arizona is going to Democrats, then it's likely several other of these states have gone blue and, and Trump is in real trouble. Um, why is it happening? Uh, both you have a combination of people who moved into the state that are a little uh, either more independent or moderate or democratic. Uh, you have a growing Latino population in that state that hues blue. Uh, you also are gonna have a very popular Democratic Senate candidate, at least as of right now, Mark Kelly, who's a former astronaut. He's the husband of the Congresswoman Gabby Giffords who was shot and nearly killed back in 2011. Uh, right now leading uh, by wide margins. Uh, in polling and in fundraising, so he could potentially help drag Biden along and get him a win there. Um, and beyond that, we always have to look at Florida. Um, it is now essentially the president's home state. Uh, it is the one that always seems to go by just tenths of a percentage point, uh, depending on what survey you're looking at or what part of the state, either Biden is narrowly ahead or the president's narrowly ahead. Um, if it goes Republican again, it's probably a big state that, that Democrats have to write off for the foreseeable future because it's just gone so Republican, even if by the narrowest of margins. But I'd look at those five to start. If you were to ask me that question in October, the answer probably changes just based on conditions on the ground. I have a question I'd like um, to go. Drop in sure, a couple Jim, of jump things in. Very quickly. One, I mean, I was astonished, and I'd be interested in um, Susan and Ed's reaction to this. Um, the last poll I saw in the Dallas Morning News uh, put Trump and Biden level. Now, I can barely believe that. Tell me. Right. If, Don't believe it. You know, this ain't going to happen this time. Right. No. Okay, fine. We we'll settle that. It's moving, but it ain't moved that far. Right. One of the things that has exercised people on this side of the water in the, cor in the coronavirus crisis in American political terms is the, the, the struggle between um, state legislatures and, and governors, principally, and the federal government. And we've all seen what Cuomo has done in New York and how his popularity has soared even among a lot of people who, for one reason or another, uh, didn't particularly like him before. Uh, Trump refers to the governor of Michigan as that woman, which I wouldn't have thought is the best way to go into an election in a state which is, as Ed said, teetering uh, you know, one way or another. To what extent uh, do people just fall into line on this question of state versus federal government? Or is the argument at the moment about competence making many people think more profoundly about the division of powers and about relative competence in the state house and in Washington? You know, it's a good and even profound question, actually, because, uh, you know, the backdrop to the Trump presidency is not just the political polarization in the United States, but it's also about the increasing divergence of, of, of worldviews and particularly views about uh, the role of government in the United States. And so you have this actually uh, very weird situation where Trump both often proclaims absolute power over everything. Uh, you know, he has the instincts uh, and habits of a would-be authoritarian, right? He likes to appear to be a strong man. He gravitates uh, towards uh, leaders like Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping and Erdogan in Turkey rather than his America's natural democratic allies uh, you know in Europe for example and yet at the same time uh, his party's ideology is to devolve power wherever possible to the states and that fits with another aspect of Trump's personality which is uh, a desire uh, to not take any responsibility at all which was another one of his sort of memorable quotes in the pandemic era so you have this weird paradox of uh, you know this this federal response machinery of public health with our Centers for Disease Control, with our Federal Emergency Management Agency, uh, and a pandemic playbook as issued, you know, by uh, our nonpartisan scientific uh, experts and bureaucracy, which envisions a federal response, and yet Trump essentially scrapping that and saying, no, actually, the governor should do it. Then when the governors do it, he's jealous uh, that they receive high marks for actually appearing to respond yeah, yeah. to the crisis while he simply blathers on at these sort of two hour sort of Castro-like, uh, you know, nightly 
uh, you know, beaming himself into people's living rooms. And so, you know, that's the tension and the political paradox, I think, behind why you see uh, most of these governors, uh, Republicans as well as Democrats, getting very high marks uh, for appearing to respond uh, to the crisis and Trump himself uh, receiving no additional bounce. So you could say, well, that's good news. Uh, for example, in Michigan, you talked about Gretchen Whitmer, the Democratic governor uh, who Trump has uh, derided, not only as that woman from Michigan, but he actually tweeted about her. He called her Gretchen Half Whitmer, uh, you know, continuing uh, a very long stream of, you know, essentially uh, misogynistic uh, treatment of female public figures by President Trump. And yet her approval ratings have never been higher before uh, the crisis. Actually, she wasn't doing that well. She was a new first term governor in Michigan. And for a while, she was just over 50%. She had started to go back up in the polls a little bit. Uh, but now she's well beyond, uh, she's capturing support from Republicans as well as Democrats for her response. Uh, now Trump has nationalized what's going on in Michigan by supporting the protesters who want to uh, end the stay at home restrictions. So she may see that come back down again a bit. But I think the point is uh, Americans see Trump for now uh, in a different bucket that has less to do with his executive capacity or lack thereof and more to do with the kind of national political debate uh, than it does to do with what government does or, or doesn't do in terms of the pandemic. So, you know, it's, it's a weird political situation right now in the U.S. Uh, and there's, there's very little consensus at the national level on anything. And, and, and just, I saw you uh, nodding on that answer. So do you, what would you like to add? Well, let me see if this works. I'll, I'll hold it up here. Does that come in? Yeah, backwards? pretty good, yeah. Okay, so that's today's poll number in a CBS survey we just released this morning. Who do you trust for information? Number one there is the Dr. Anthony Fauci, the guy who's the head of the Infectious Disease Department. Right behind him is your governor, then Vice President Pence, then President Trump. I mean, that is the dynamic that you've seen in poll after poll after poll. The medical professionals, followed by your local officials, followed by the federal officials getting the most um, approval or, or, or embodying the most trust of Americans. And, and frankly, that's a dynamic at work in journalism as well. If you look at surveys, people, who do you trust? Who are you turning to for this? They say, we're turning to our local uh, television station or our local newspaper before we go to oh, the national. So it's that's a because similar... you don't have the BBC yet. That's well, Sorry. exactly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's good a, that's another topic. This is, this, this, <laughs> um, I mean, this is really fascinating because if the, if the reason, and I think people outside the States always find it difficult to explain the whole of the base, the Trump base, and particularly they say, well, hang on, if you're an evangelical voter and if your religious conviction and your ideas about society come from that view of the world, um, how on earth can you support somebody like Trump if, you, you know, if you've got a moral vision for what kind of country it should be? And the answer, presumably, that we would all agree on is Trump says, I'm against all the things that you're against. Forget about my dalliance with Stormy Daniels or whoever it is and all the women and everything else in Moscow. Uh, look, I represent a disruptive attack on all the forces that you don't like, a creeping state, uh, intervention with your lives, all that stuff, all represented in federal agencies, represented again by Dr. Fauci. But the problem with this, it seems to me, is that that appeal to his base, here is what I represent, so you'll always be with me, whatever you may not like about some financial crookery or some sexual dalliance. The problem now is that it may be an argument about competence. And it seems to me, if you just look at the handling and what he said in January, what he then said in February, it's beyond argument that, you know, he said, I know more about pandemics than the doctors. I know more about ISIS than the generals. I mean, it's the old Trump story. Are people going to buy that when the death toll goes above 100,000? And as you had said, everyone's going to know somebody who either lost a job or died. And at that point, people say, well, hang on a minute. Is this all because of the Chinese? And they will conclude, I would have thought, many of them, no. And yeah. Susie, jump in. So look, I, that is a very rational uh, and uh, legitimate analysis. Uh, but the numbers so far 
suggest that essentially uh, even Trump's most fervent supporters are capable of holding uh, simultaneously contradictory views, which yeah. is to say they may actually agree with your analysis uh, of yeah. the pandemic or wish that he had handled it differently. Uh, and yet also, uh, you know, in the end, finding that their uh, tribal and personal loyalties to the president uh, overcome those reservations, uh, you know, and Ed is right to show you that slide. But the other aspect of that polling that has been consistent from the beginning is that there's one subset of American voters for whom that hierarchy of trust on coronavirus information uh, does not apply in the way that you saw. And that is the subset of people who self-defined themselves as loyal Republican voters. And they essentially are um, absenting themselves from the, the rest of the consensus in the rest of American society. And for them, Dr. Fauci and uh, public health professionals are still respected, and Donald Trump is either number one or number two uh, in terms of uh, the information that they're receiving on coronavirus, which is astonishing. You would think that there would be no segment of American society that would prefer to receive information about their health from Donald Trump, uh, but uh, in fact, there is this one subset of American society, uh, Trump super fans, Trump Republican, core diehard faithful. Now that's not enough, uh, not only to win a majority in the popular vote, it's not even enough to win probably a majority of electoral votes. Up until the coronavirus, the Trump campaign and Trump himself had constructed a remarkable plan, it seems to me, for his reelection, which was basically to say to maybe the, you know, kind of wavering 10% of Republicans who, uh, you know, still identify or still want to vote Republican, but don't really love the president. Uh, their appeal to them was basically, you know, he's a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch. Uh, yeah. And that, uh, you know, was actually explicitly what they were uh, using as their campaign pitch. And I expect them, by the way, to revert to that, uh, because there's really no way to overcome uh, the fundamental remaining doubts uh, among that group of wavering Republicans about his character. Uh, you know, he's not going to change who he is. Uh, but essentially, uh, he's a fighter for us. Uh, and he's against um, all the things that we're against, yeah. I think is a very powerful motivating tool. Um, just one minor point on that. Uh, he's against what we're against. I call these uh, Republicans the anti-Trump. -anti uh, Republicans. Uh, they really don't like to defend Trump anymore. And by the way, this is a pretty large group, both among Republican elected officials and, uh, you know, Republican leaning columnists and, and commentators. They have stopped actually, by and large, overtly defending Trump. These are not the sycophants that you, you often see, you know, publicly appearing alongside him and praising him. But they, what they do is they help Trump by bashing Trump's enemies. They're motivated by their negative antipathy towards Trump's opponents. And I, in the end, the question is really, will that be enough for them to stick with him in November? So far, the answer has been yes. But we'll see um, whether that. I'd like to go to some questions. We're getting some questions uh, online. And I'd like to pose this to Ed. There's a Carol, and I may uh, mangle this name, Nara, who says, I'd like to shift back to Biden here. How can Biden compete with Trump's war on Twitter and these kinds of terrible tactics? Um, it proved successful uh, in the last election. And I'm curious to hear, Ed, what do you think Biden, particularly now, holed up in his home, unable to go out and campaign uh, in, in the real world? Um, what can he do? Well, you ask him, you ask his team, and they think they're doing just fine for now. Thank you very much. Uh, don't you dare question our, 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 our plans. Um, you know, he, he was asked about this in an interview yesterday, and he said essentially, look, you know, uh, we're leading. Um, and that is true. He is leading by single digits in those battleground states that we talked about and in the national head-to-head -head matchup. Uh, but so was Hillary Clinton at this point mm. uh, four years ago, you know. So it's a perilous uh, lead. And there are growing concerns among Democrats who, frankly, are always concerned about something when it comes to their electoral chances. Uh, they are professional pearl clutchers. Uh, 
and I say that with all due respect, uh, that, that, you know, that the coalition he has to build won't hold. Uh, reporting out this morning about his uh, inability so far to demonstrate that he's actively and uh, effectively organizing Latino voters in this country. They'll be concerned that with the myriad of vote by mail rules across the country, the campaign might not have a good handle on who exactly they have to be targeting. As one smart democratic activist said to me yesterday, my concern, that's what she said, my concern is that we're not going to know what the blind spot was until it's over. That because of the fact that so many people are now holed up, because they can't do traditional knocking on doors or reaching people at rallies or, you know, just the standard tried and true tactics that have worked in the past, that something won't become apparent that went wrong or that wasn't done enough until after the fact. Even four years ago, there was evidence that Clinton might lose Michigan or Wisconsin in, in, in some polling and people were raising their hands and concerned about it and it was ignored. In this case, there's just worry that they won't be able to figure it out. For now, he's confined to his basement. Um, he's doing interviews like this and unless or until stay at home restrictions are lifted in his state and in other battleground states, the plan, and they go week by week on this, is for him to stay home and keep doing it from there. And I'll just very drop something in at this point, which is surely important, and it follows exactly from what you say. Um, clearly, given his age, uh, his choice of running mate is going to be much more than usually important in the sense that she, and we know it will be she, um, is going to be presented to the American people as somebody who has probably got more likelihood of being president than the normal the normal running mate has. I mean, Tim Kaine, you could forget about him. I mean, it did, you know, unless they do something wrong, people certainly outside the States and the country as a whole don't really worry too much about the running mate, right? This time they will. Who is it going to pick? Well, Frank, I think Frank had a simple, hold on, let me just defer to Frank here for a second, because I think you may have had a, a, a follow up there. And I know you want to get into running mate. All right, so okay. I, Sorry, I do, Frank. I do, yeah, I do. Roy. Metropolis, I'm just taking uh, one of the questions to um, involve the audience. Since we're talking a little bit about social media, he's saying how big a role will social media, actually the question I was gonna ask Ed is a challenge for reporters, particularly you and Susan, how do you cover this when you're, when you're physically stuck at home? I mean, you would cover it normally by being out and about, talking to people all the time, getting the energy in the room, the sort of thing you can't get from television. And so given this is such a challenging election to cover and analyze, how is the press corps in the United States going to manage this? Right here. I mean, this is, this is <laughs> the way, this is the only way we can do it. You just gotta be texting and calling people all day long. I even said to my wife yesterday, uh, I need to be doing more of it and I'm doing a decent amount. Um, I mean, the way we're doing it now is you're joining me from the, uh, one corner of my bedroom. I never thought I'd have studio lighting in my bedroom, at least not for reporting reasons. And, uh, you know, we have to do it from here. And it's, and it's surreal, uh, but it, it, it is what it is for now. And you're right, we're missing, we're missing seeing him in action. We're missing how people would respond to it. You're missing that ability to talk to his staff and his traveling aides um, and to cultivate those relationships that you need. Uh, in the event that he wins, uh, because a lot of those people end up going on to work for the winner um, for you know any length of time, um, we're missing the ability to really understand what people who show up uh, are thinking and hoping and why they're showing up. And yet, you don't want to just use the bubble as your way of, of figuring out what's going on. You have to stay outside that bubble. Uh, but being inside it with him is valuable and is important. And I said to one of my uh, senior producers last week, I said, one of the potential downfalls for him uh, or challenges will be if he doesn't get to know the press corps that would be following him over the course of the campaign, uh, the ability to, to sort of have some understanding and some relationship with it once he becomes president will be very different. Uh, there won't be, you know, Trump, love it or hate it, became very familiar with a lot of the people who cover him. Obama, the same. Bush and Clinton before them. Uh, Biden isn't necessarily going to have that. And, um, and that is a meta issue, a very micro issue for those of us in the business and, and for how he is perceived by the rest of the public. But it's one of the many potential transitional challenges he would have 
were he to win. Um, and it's going to be frustrating for him and his campaign because they can't see us and be talking to us and be interacting with us on a daily basis as we try to cover him. And we're all going to get justifiably frustrated and concerned about the fact that we aren't near him and we aren't around him uh, to get a better sense of how this is going. So it, it is a challenge and it's one we haven't sorted out yet and there's no right answer for it. Um, but it's uh, something that wears on us every single day. Well, Susan, look, do you I mean, have... jump in, please. Sorry, go ahead. No, I'd like to hear what you think about this and how you're approaching the challenge. Well, look, there are a couple uh, different things. Number one, I would say that there are very different challenges when it comes to uh, thinking about Trump and covering Trump uh, in this crisis, biggest crisis of his presidency, and then the bigger but uh, you know parallel but different challenge of covering uh, this U.S. presidential election, and that's uh, always true. Uh, in a way, Trump, as a man who exists almost as a, a, a social media simulacrum of a, of a president and of a presidency, uh, you know, who essentially has already been spending hours a day watching television in a mutually reinforcing commentary cycle. Uh, you know, we're now living closer to his reality, <laughs> uh, you know, because we're forced to be indoors and not talking to other people than, uh, than uh, we were before. So covering Trump, I think, is, is one issue where, uh, you know, it's, it's a challenge, obviously, uh, especially for those people who are, you know, I'm, I'm a columnist, but for those people whose job it is to you know, write news out of the, the White House, understanding there's an enormous turnover that continues, by the way, inside Trump's White House and his administration. So I imagine for reporters like Ed or, or for my husband, who's the New York Times' chief White House correspondent, you know, you miss out by, you know, not being physically there, uh, not getting to know and talk with people, not being able to travel uh, with them and to interact in ways that give you insight, especially because, there's a sort of a Kremlinology aspect to this White House uh, that is even more profound uh, than in other White Houses, right? So that's true to a large extent uh, in any presidency because America has had an increasingly imperial uh, executive uh, for, for decades now, but it's even more true with Trump because he explodes uh, normal procedure uh, and well, decision making. Yeah. He does not empower his subordinates, uh, even when he's not firing them, he's undercutting them. Uh, and so uh, the normal uh, kind of sources for information that you might have in covering a, a presidency and in a crisis like this, uh, you know, health reporters would have spent years cultivating, uh, you know, the experts at the Department of Health and Human Services and at the CDC and the like. But since Donald Trump has insisted on overruling them or acting in a, a haphazard and inconsistent way, uh, he has amassed a kind of enormous negative power in his own person and in the presidency that makes uh, a form of uh, observational Kremlinology more important to journalism right now. So I'm more able to sit here in my kitchen and to uh, understand the thinking uh, and actions of this president than perhaps other presidents in a way that matters. Uh, but when it comes to covering the campaign, as Ed pointed out, uh, this is an enormous problem uh, and challenge. Now, I actually happen to think that, you know, Biden is such a creature of Washington and of our political system. After decades here, he was the youngest senator when he was elected in the 1970s. When I was just a, a baby, he came here to Washington for the first time, and he's never really left it. Uh, he does have longstanding relationships uh, with, you know, not only across the aisle, but with, um, you know, journalists. Uh, but I think it's that inability to understand, you know, and to pick up that political IQ and antenna, both for the candidate, he's missing out on that by not being able to appear with voters and to talk with them, especially somebody who's so tactile as, as Joe Biden of a politician. Uh, and then also uh, not being able to really go around the country uh, and campaign, even forgetting the candidate himself, his own campaign operation, I think, is missing valuable sources of information. Although, again, in a crisis, you know, these state officials and governors who are Democrats, uh, you know, are presumably learning an awful lot about what really matters in their states. And, uh, you know, the, the best 
thing may well be for those politicians who are actually doing something to help Americans now in the middle of a crisis. Uh, and I think that, you know, I remember covering Vladimir Putin's first re-election campaign after four years, uh, you know, in the Kremlin. So Russia's democracy was already being dismantled, but it still sort of existed. And at that point, the main liberal uh, opposition did coalesce. They belatedly and too late realized the threat that, that Putin posed. The one campaign ad that they ran that I think really sealed their fate was an ad of the three main leaders of the opposition, the Democratic, small d, Western-oriented liberal opposition, flying in a private aircraft above Russia, sitting in you know, creamy leather seats discussing you know, how they would fix the problems of the country and how much better they would be. They didn't do a darn thing. Uh, to show how they could be better. So, you know, in many ways, the best campaigning right now is to actually do what Trump is not doing for Democrats and to, you know, try to deal with this crisis. Yeah, you know, the, Jim had a really good I mean, question about- That's a very penetrating about, account of the practical difficulties that, that you've got as journalists in the campaign. It just strikes me, just a very brief sentence or two on this, that. There is also another problem. You made the distinction, Susan, which is um, admirably much clearer in the States than it is here between columnists and those who deal with the news. That the way Trump, the disruptor, has dealt with power and talked about the powers of his office, and frankly, just behaved in office, breaking all the rules, means that it's extraordinarily difficult for journalists, newspapers, and broadcast outlets to avoid being sucked into the maelstrom of divisiveness, one side or the other, you're for me or you're against me, the complete binary view of the world, which is so destructive, although it has obviously helped Trump in the sense that it got him to the White House, it worked. Uh, but for journalism, it's a real difficulty in how you cover somebody who is actually you know, singing from a completely different score. It's just utterly as my favorite story, by the way, it'll only take 20 seconds, walking back from the inauguration, where, of course, there was that terribly small crowd, as we all know, but anyway, that's just a side matter. Um, and it was a horrible day, as you remember, cold and wet. And I was with a friend on the, on the Washington Post, as it happens, and we're walking up Pennsylvania Avenue, and I said that I was trying to get a ticket for Hamilton, which had just opened on Broadway about six months before, and I was hoping to see it on my way home. And he said, you do realize that the script for the Trump presidency is not going to be written by Alexander Hamilton. It's going to be written by Mario Puzo, which is about my favorite Trumpist observation. I'll leave it there. Um, Carry on, and sorry, Frank. Let's go back to the vice presidential question. Um, Biden has talked about a, uh, a woman yeah. who was on that list and who would help him the most? Oof. So that that that's harder to answer. Uh, who who we but who are we are led to believe is on the list um, is for the first time all women. Uh, three of his former opponents essentially topped the list of preferred contenders. If you ask Democrats, but that may be driven by the fact that they're the best known: Elizabeth Warren, Kamala Harris, the senator from California, and Amy Klobuchar, the moderate senator from Minnesota. Of those three. Klobuchar has demonstrated to Biden uh, an immediate electoral knack, if you will, in that her dropping out just before her home state voted on a Super Tuesday delivered Biden a victory that wasn't necessarily assured before that. Um, and there is evidence, not only in Minnesota, but also in places like Texas, that her decision to drop out and endorse him helped push voters to him in that primary. So she has immediate electoral results uh, to her advantage. She is not, however, uh, as liberal uh, as Elizabeth Warren, or frankly, black, like Kamala Harris. Uh, those are two attributes that many in the party would like to see uh, embodied in the running mate. However, uh, you look at the polling we've done, race is less of a factor. And there's an acknowledgement that while they would like to see someone more progressive, perhaps someone who's more moderate has the potential to bring over that small fraction of people who are trying to decide between Trump and Biden. And yet, there's been no evidence in modern presidential campaign history that the vice presidential candidate necessarily helps 
inspire people to vote for the presidential candidate, if anything, it might hurt. Uh, the most recent example perhaps being Sarah Palin and the concerns later in the campaign after she was chosen that she might not have been ready for the job uh, and a job that much like in the case with Biden, there was a chance she could have potentially inherited given the advanced age of John McCain. Uh, ultimately, Biden has essentially two factors. Who's equipped to do the job on day one if something happens to him? Uh, and who is he, as he likes to say, simpatico with him? He likes to use that word specifically. Who does he have a relationship with? Who can he have lunch with at least once a week? Who could be the last person in the room with him? And the other thing he has to be thinking about, and he doesn't say it out loud, but it is essentially implied, is who potentially could run for president in four years as the Democratic nominee if, for whatever reason, he decides not to. And he hasn't been able to say outright that he would run for a second term. He suggested in some interviews that after three years, he might make a decision about whether or not he should. Um, so that will have to be a factor as well. There are plenty of other names. Uh, Stacey Abrams, this woman who was the failed gubernatorial candidate in Georgia, seems to be a fan favorite, but doesn't meet any of the real requirements that Biden has laid out, given that she was really only a menial state official. Uh, there's some congresswoman, Val Demings, who's from the Orlando area. So probably somebody who gets a job in the administration regardless. African-American, former ch police chief of Orlando. Her husband's the very popular mayor of Orange County, Florida. They both have been in law enforcement for decades. Uh, two Latina women, uh, Catherine Cortez Masto, the senator from Nevada, who's the first Hispanic woman to serve in the Senate. And the governor of New Mexico, Michelle Lujan Grisham, they get mentioned. Even Susan Rice, who was President Obama's national security advisor, gets mentioned as well, because in some ways she has some of the attributes that Biden might be looking for. We don't expect an answer from him until July at the latest, but his campaign has made very clear that they could try to spring a surprise announcement on us sooner to try to get a boost of momentum coming out of the pandemic. We have another question from Mahala Mohedin. How much of an impact will Tara Reid have on Biden's chances? Is that story passed or will we be hearing more about it in the fall? Is that for me or is it for- <laughs> Whoever wants to take it, Susan? It needs to be answered from Washington, doesn't it? Yeah. Probably, yeah. No, look, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, you know, I think uh, that there's sort of two parallel questions here. One is, uh, will we uh, find out more information that, you know, has a bearing on, you know, the, the veracity of these uh, allegations, uh, which are, you know, come from a former staffer to uh, Vice President Biden when he was in the Senate. They're from 27 years ago. Uh, one of the issues uh, with this woman is that she changed her story over time. A year ago, she spoke with reporters and did not make this allegation. In fact, specifically said uh, not that Biden had uh, 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 assaulted her or even harassed her. Now she says that both things occurred. Uh, you know, will, is there additional documentary evidence? Uh, for example, she has said that she did file uh, some version of a complaint with the Senate uh, office. Uh, the Senate, however, has said it didn't, by the way, not mention sexual harassment, uh, but at least would, you know, lend some uh, credibility to the idea that she made a, a contemporaneous complaint. Biden has asked the Senate to release whatever records exist. The Senate has said it is not able to do so because of the confidentiality rules that, that bind that office. So one question is whether we, will we get any more evidence uh, or information that would tend to uh, confirm or disprove the specific allegations made by Tara Reid. Uh, and then the other question is, uh, what political impact, if any, will it have? Now, of course, you're dealing with uh, Biden running against a president who's been credibly accused of sexual harassment or assault by, I think it's the number right now is 26 different women. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, versus this one allegation against Biden and then a number of women who came forward last year and said that he had what they considered to be a history of inappropriate uh, touching and physical closeness. Uh, you know, for Trump's purposes, I think the specifics of the allegation don't matter nearly as much as the fact that there's something that he can point to, uh, you know, the sort of confusion fog machine, the everybody does it, everybody's corrupt. Uh, that was actually the playbook that he used uh, with the Ukraine allegations that led to his impeachment of the Democratic House. Essentially, Trump, you know, tried to say, well, but Biden's son is also crooked in some way that, that of course, was not really parallel at all 
but was politically useful to him. So I imagine that from the Republican point of view, it's just politically useful to have an unresolved allegation hanging out there. Uh, but my basic view is that, uh, you know, unless much more information were to come out either about this complaint or of uh, any other women stepping forward in a way that they never have to accuse Biden, uh, that it probably is not a significant change. There's a huge gender gap in this race uh, with, uh, you know, women by and large being much more skeptical about Donald Trump. I think that that's likely to persist regardless of the, the allegation. Let's go to another question, Jonathan Sadler. Jonathan, I'm gonna unmute you. Uh, if you'd like to ask the question and, and ask it to a specific panelist. Hi, oh, yeah, I was just curious as to whether, um, you know, there's a close call situation with the election Trump loses, but he refuses to acknowledge the, the loss and sits tight. What actually happens in that situation? Who wants to take a stab? Well, Thanks, the, Jonathan. the outsider first, I mean, presumably, and I, I'll sort of ask this um, of Washington in a way, but presumably what happens is that depending what the accusation is, because he would have to have an accusation about malpractice of some kind or inadequate counting, as we saw in Florida in 2000, and um, there would have to be a state investigation, but inevitably it would end up in the Supreme Court, wouldn't it? Be bound to. Hard to see Susan, how it couldn't. Ed? Inconceivably, yeah. Um, it's funny, this was actually a question that was asked of several Democratic candidates during the early primary season by people in Iowa and New Hampshire of, of the exact question James just asked. What would you do if he literally does not want to leave the building? Um, because I guess it was, this is something that's actually been discussed and if somebody knows this, correct me if I'm wrong, I guess it's Bill Maher, the HBO talk show host, who's actually brought this up in one way or another uh, on his program about concerns that, that Trump might not actually respect the transition. And we should point out, there is a federal law that was passed in 2010, I remember because I covered it uh, when I was at the Post, that actually now sort of codifies what's supposed to happen from one next. Just in the past week, the Trump administration has actually begun the transition process as required by law. There are some career bureaucrats or people at the Office of Management and Budget, it's called, in the building right next to the White House, that are beginning to put the transition plan in place. And later this summer, they are required by law to take it to the Democratic nominee and begin essentially offering them uh, a peek inside and to begin making preparations in the event that Biden were to win. So that process at least is underway. There were some early concerns it might not be, but so far the Trump administration appears to be keeping to the letter of the law. We'll see. Well, just a final addendum okay. on, this, on this point. Um, there are two key moments. One is the election itself. The other is the meeting of the U.S. Electoral College and the certification, you know, by the Electoral College of, uh, you know, a decision in the vote. So there's not actually a new president until the Electoral College meets, uh, I believe, in, in late December uh, and casts its vote by state delegation, uh, generally by the results of the election in that state. But again, there's some flexibility in some states there. So, you know, if there's a too close to call situation like 2000 in Florida, uh, you know, that's where you could potentially see litigation and Trump refusing to concede the election. However, I would say that if the Electoral College meets and there is an outcome and it is, uh, you know, not contested, uh, we've only had one time in our history in 1876 in which that was not the case, in which there was actually a tie in the US Electoral College. Uh, but let's say that we're not dealing with that. If the Electoral College meets and certifies a new president that is not Donald Trump, I don't believe there's any scenario under which he can remain in office. And I believe that from that moment forward, even legally, there's been some discussion of this, but even before the January 20th uh, inauguration, of the new president. Uh, from that moment forward, I believe that the entire machinery of the US government, uh, you know, essentially would have switched. And, you know, remember that the Secret Service, uh, you know, is charged with the personal protection of the president, and it would be up to them 
uh, you know, like were Trump not to leave, I, I think they would escort him out of the building. So I'm not worried about that. I'm not worried about a situation where if the Electoral College has decided that Trump lost, it seems to me that Trump lost and that I'm, I don't think there's any question how the American system would handle that, including Republicans. I think there is a more real worry about an uncertain outcome before the Electoral College meets. Yeah. Uh, we have another question from Joel Levy. Uh, Joel, uh, please ask your question. You should be unmuted. Can you unmute yourself? I, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we my, can. Please, yeah, my, please my ask your question. Was, uh, well, the, his, the his, seems to me the history of the, um, uh, well, all elections really is that emotion, emotion wins elections, not reason. And uh, is there any sign that the Democrats understand that this year, like Bill Clinton, like Bill Clinton did, and Hillary didn't? I just have one one final thing to say on that, and then uh, let Ed wrap it up. Yes, there is no more powerful uh, motivating factor in American <laughs> politics right now, positive or negative, than Donald Trump. And Democrats actually have a very visceral emotional appeal right now, which is no more Trump. Uh, and that is a pretty powerful uh, force. Uh, we'll see if it's enough. Historically, the other thing that an American candidate needed besides emotion was uh, some positive vision of the future that uh, you know he was outlining. Uh, you know, will Biden be judged to have sufficient amounts of that? I don't know. Will he be judged to have sufficient amounts of anti-Trump uh, emotion? Yes, absolutely. I just yeah. want to let Ed finish up, but just a thought here. Um, I thought that in watching Biden in the last few months, and indeed listening to him over the last two or three years, this argument, which is his fundamental one, that uh, America has disappeared from view for you people. You've seen it uh, transfigured by this uh, disruptive president who lies and breaks the law and all the things, as you, you, you might put it like that. Um, what I'm going to do is I will step off my rocking chair on a Norman Rockwell painting and give you back something kind of morning again in America, Reagan 84, a little bit like that, saying, look, we're better than this. We can do better than this. And that seems to me, as an outsider, to be a deeply emotional message, actually. And Biden, in, in his grandfatherly sort of way, I mean, that's not meant pejoratively, it was just a fact, um, it seems to me equipped to make that appeal. And I don't think that's one that's a devoid of emotion. And it seems to me that one of the difficulties of the Clinton campaign, which we all saw, was that it did seem, despite, as again, we all know, her private passions and her utter commitment and determination, all the rest of it, it seemed so often to be too cold, not emotional enough, funnily enough, despite her own passions. Biden, uh, by contrast, always seems to me to wear his emotion on his sleeve. You know, whether it's about his son, his family, it's, you know, the, the troubles his family has seen. And, you know, the guy from Scranton who still rode the, Ram, the Amtrak to Wilmington every night from the Senate. That is a deeply emotional appeal. And it seems to me from the outside that if he can manage it, it's potentially a very powerful one. Ed and Susan, we're almost out of time here. We're just coming down in the last few minutes. And I was just wondering if you have some parting wisdom you'd like to share with us across the Atlantic as we continue into this race? Um, well, first off, I was thrilled to be able to join you guys because in many ways, my journalism career actually began in London, um, at least my professional one. I was an intern with a group called Global Radio News, which is now known as GRN Live. Yeah. And they had a small office in the Press Association building. And so for well, one of my college semesters, I would go there uh, once or twice a week. And it was in London that I realized I wanted to do this for a living. So always happy to, to talk to our British colleagues um, and an opportunity to talk about this stuff, especially. Um, look, I think, um, you know, the one thing, I mean, the things to watch for are what we've discussed. Look at those five or six states that seem most competitive. Uh, keep an eye on the the mechanics of how people will vote in this country and whether that begins to cause real uh, pandemic style problems and chaos uh, of a political and sort of democratic lowercase d variety. Um, and, and you know, the argument over, uh, I think to Joel's point, uh, can, can Democrats uh, convince enough people uh, that Biden's argument is the one worth, worth taking right now? I think the one thing that 
a few polls in the last week or so have pointed out is you ask the people, you don't like either of these guys, but which one would you vote for if you had to? Biden is blowing Trump away in that regard. Trump blew away Clinton in that regard four years ago. So that's one potential indicator that the lesser of two evils in this case for those people is Biden. Well, in a race where there may just be a small percentage of people that decide this, that might be one of the ways. And so keep an eye on that. Do, do Biden's negatives come up, causing that kind of a question to become more muddied? Um, I think that may be one of the only real ways that this happens. Um, and the other thing I keep thinking, I know this was something, Frank, you had, you had sort of asked about is, will we see for the first time here, perhaps, more of a British style election in that there really will be only about six weeks once we come out of the summer where these two guys can go out and, and, and mount some kind of a traditional campaign, uh, visiting the states, holding rallies, or will the pandemic hold them back to the extent that they can't do that? And if we do have an abbreviated six week style campaign like you do in the UK, might Americans go, we should do that more often and not necessarily allow this to stretch out for two years. I don't know where I stand on that, but uh, that, that'll, that'll reignite the debate for sure. Susan, I'd like to give you the last word. Well, thank you. What a great discussion uh, today. Really enjoyed it as well as all the, the questions. Um, you know, look, uh, on paper, there really is no way that Donald Trump should win re-election to the presidency uh, in this fall. Uh, and, uh, you know, generally speaking, an incumbent with approval ratings like he has, which are unlikely to shift significantly, uh, you know, certainly by June of the election year, uh, that's usually been written in stone, uh, you know, that somebody uh, who was looked upon this unfavorably by so much of the American public, uh, combined with an economy that now uh, not only has plunged to depths we haven't seen since the Great Depression, uh, but is unlikely to recover uh, uh, enough in time by November to make a material difference. Those two things alone, those are the two things the president's approval ratings in June of the election year and the situation uh, of the economy with uh, unemployment should be determinative. But of course, uh, you know, if that were the case, then, you know, in terms of our history, Donald Trump wouldn't be president in the first place. Uh, so he got unbelievably lucky in 2016. Uh, he essentially, you know, had a very narrow path. He ran it. He also was aided at the last minute uh, by James Comey uh, and uh, Hillary Clinton. And, you know, he would have to be even luckier to do that again. So am I telling you Donald Trump is definitely gonna lose in November? No, I'm not. Uh, there is no one here in Washington, uh, as there probably isn't anyone in London who is going to believe the outcome of this election until not only is it over, but if Trump loses, that he is actually escorted from the building by the Secret Service. So, you know, predictions are not as useful as they might have once seemed uh, in a world that is being upended. Uh, I agree with Ed that if you're really wanting to uh, look at something, that the big question is who's going to be able to vote and who's going to want to vote on November 3rd. Uh, uh, given the uncertainties of this pandemic year. Uh, by the numbers, Trump should lose, but that does not mean that he will. And so uh, in that situation, the campaign, whatever it turns out to be, may well matter. Uh, in the meantime, you know, have a thought and a prayer for all of us trapped here in our kitchens or our bedroom offices uh, in Washington, uh, you know, living inside the Twitter uh, stylings of Donald J. Trump. 24 hours a day. It has uh, been a unique form of hazardous journalistic <laughs> duty. And uh, I'm always grateful for the chance to talk about it, but thank you very much. Well, on behalf you, of the Frontline Club, I'd like to thank all three of you for coming. This was an absolutely fascinating and extremely educational exercise. And I, I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in in the middle of the day here this afternoon in London and around the United Kingdom for this. And again, uh, to James Nochte, uh, special correspondent with the BBC and author of On the Road, American Adventures from Nixon to Trump, Ed O'Keefe, political correspondent for CBS News, and Susan Glasser of The New, York, of the New Yorker.
thank you all very much uh, for taking time out. And uh, I learned a ton. I really appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you all very much. Thank you.